Uh, it suits me fine, actually. Yeah, because I can go in there. Uh, shopping and stuff you know not be recognized occasionally someone comes up to me it's, it's quite nice you know if people do but I, it's the characters that are known you know which which is the preferable way yeah for me definitely i'm quite I'm quite shy shy kind of person <laughs> it's an odd thing really because most people come into show business to want to be the star presumably you're the opposite of that that you want your characters to be the stars yeah i mean i you know, I mean, I have an ego. I like, you know, it's quite nice sometimes. But yeah, the characters are the stars. And I feel a bit sorry for people who are very famous because they, you're not always in the mood to cope with people coming up to you to ask for things, autographs and stuff. So, so, and that, so that, that doesn't affect me, which is very nice, really. What are you most proud of? Is there a single film you've made or a single animation that you've put together that you are determined is going to be the best thing of your career? The most satisfying, you know, uh, looking at it that way, uh, I think for me has been uh, the original Creature Comforts. Just because it was very short, you know, it took kind of five months to do the whole thing, about three months to do the filming, and you know, recording people's voices was much easier than writing a script, <laughs> you know, because it was using real, you know, vox pop interviews and just editing that really, and then thinking of who can be what animal and designing the animals and then animating it, which took a bit of time, but but then that five minute film then won an Oscar so and wait, when you spend you know five years on a movie you know it's, the amount of effort you put in is, is enormous you know for what you get out of it I think the other thing I feel particularly proud of I guess is uh, The Wrong Trousers for me that was well it's the one that gets the critical acclaim above all of all of the Wallace and Gromit films really I mean this one's been enjoying a lot of that as well which is great but The Wrong Trousers as a 30 minute film it, it, it suited 30 minutes really well and was just the right size of story and just the ideas you know that the penguin and the techno trousers and it was a nice for me a nice group of ideas uh, and it was quirky and and people hadn't seen that kind of thing before so it was all new and and it, it's very hard to repeat that kind of originality again the thing that i find most fascinating if it's taking five years to make a 90 minute film how do you know anywhere in those five years that you haven't lost the plot and it's become unfunny or you haven't got a plot mm. anymore yeah that was the difficulty you know about taking on such a long haul project is that i think you first of all you've got to have an idea that almost like demands to be made really i don't think i could do it if it was motivated by anything else you know by money or awards or any kind of commercial or public expectation i it's got to be something that really grabs me. And it's got to be funny, you know, the outset. That, that it's got to be basically absurd and funny, uh, you know, in its concept, you know. And I think it was when this idea struck me, it was it was automatic, really, that it, I had to make this film. And, and then it's a matter of, yeah, you can easily lose confidence in ideas over the time. Uh, you know, many times that happened. In fact, that's why it's been good working with... Um, Steve Box, who was the other director on the movie, um, and we, you know, we were very much writing it together and from the from the beginning. And it's with with big animated films like this, you you've got to have two directors, I, I think, because not just to kind of share the load, but it's like a companion as well. And Steve was always very good at helping me keep confidence in my own sensibilities, and you know, especially when there were studio pressures and you know to compromise and everything. Everybody else has an objective point of view on your film, except you. <laughs> I suppose the other problem as well is not having too many people involved because you don't want too many opinions that can take you one way and distract you with, oh, well, this gag's better or that scene would be funnier. You've yeah. actually just got to get on and make it and then hope at the end that you've made the right decision. You're so involved with getting every little sound effect, every piece, every music cue, every timing of every joke exactly right. And you work on every single thing <laughs> in such detail. And you've no idea. You never know. And so when, when we've got the first reviews in and I, I saw the first audience reaction, it was, it was just relief more than anything mm -hmm. that it, it worked, you know. You know, never mind any awards. I was just relieved it worked. Your medium animation has to be the most time intensive, even yeah. compared to a Hollywood blockbuster. They would never have the budget to spend five years on one 90-minute film, would they? No, no, I, I suppose not. I mean, three years of that was sort of writing and designing and developing and storyboarding, you know. So the, the actual filming itself took about a year and a half to two years. That, that was, you know, a, a crew of 250 people about 50 of those were model makers and about 30 of them were animators 
and it, a very slow process. It's you know, very labour intensive when you see the credits on any any big you know CGI you know computer animated film. It's the, about the same number of people, in fact. Uh, Wallace and Gromit has become one of those Christmas favourites that if you don't see it, it somehow isn't Christmas. How have you managed to do that? Oh gosh, uh, yeah. Well, it's kind of it hasn't happened overnight. It, it, it happened with. Uh, you know, A Grand Day Out, which is the first Wallace and Gromit film, which was partly a... Well, it was a, started off as a college film. I started at the National Film and TV School and, and yeah, then went brought it with me to Ardman in Bristol. Um, and I think... It, I mean, it wasn't known. It took a long time for A Grand Day Out to sort of take off, really, because Creech, I did Creature Comforts just at the end, towards the end of making that, and that sort of stole the limelight because it won the first Oscar back in 1990. And, and, um, and then sort of... Wallace and Gromit was a kind of slow burn thing, really, that people gradually got to see it and, and started to respond to it. And then, you know, over, over about six or seven years, you know, BBC were interested in doing a second and, a, and then, you know, Wrong Trousers and then Close Shave. You know, every couple of years we did another one. And, um, and they, they started to slowly become a kind of a holiday fixture <laughs> and creature comforts, I guess because it's comedy and it's light and it's got a kind of British you know kind of cosy you know cosy Britishness at the same time I hope a kind of quirkiness you know and that's I think why the parents like it as well because there's kind of two levels to it I was saying to you as we came into the studio the more you kind of get the idea of your animation the more you look out for it for example the fridge was called Smug not mm -hmm. Smeg now I wonder how many people actually notice that because that's a very cleverly crafted gag mm -hmm. that's there for the taking if you want it isn't it uh, yeah, there's, uh, that's that's um, in a way why I think they've always done quite well on video and DVD as well because people get to stop stop the frames and read the gags and uh, yeah, notice the little background things. I think I think it comes from the fact that it is because it's models. <laughs> you, you know, from back when I used to do it all myself. You know, before working with larger teams of you know back at college. Uh, I just got a lot of fun out of making the models and putting in all these little references that were just done, that were just personal. They weren't actually meant to be noticed by anybody to start with because I didn't want them to kind of distract from the story. Uh, but they've more and more have gone in, you know, over the years. And sometimes the model makers come up with ideas or the set builders and, you know, you see somebody's name on a street or, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever. <laughs> Are there um, any comedy writers for your animations, or is it all just your ideas and people there who go, "Why, that's a funny gag. We could stick that in." Um, there's a, I mean, like all filmmaking, it's a, a very collaborative effort. And you know, on this film, I worked heavily with Steve Box on the writing, and a, another writer, um, Mark Burton, who's done a lot of gag writing for BBC and, and what have you. And, and he worked. He was a writer on Madagascar as well. Um, so it's a very collaborative effort, but. An awful lot of the stuff comes together in the first few weeks, even the first week, actually. Because as soon as you have the idea and you know it's going to run, it's just a field day, really. You can't stop. <laughs> you know? When you have an idea, it just kind of sparks off in lots of directions. Mm. Uh, so it's not, that's kind of, in a way, the easy bit. But I think as you, as you work for longer and longer, because it takes so long to do animation, you have time to keep coming up with stuff. And you, you sort of... The danger is you... Or oh, maybe it's the strength of it as well. You, you get bored. With, not bored, but you get used to your own gags. And, yeah. and so you constantly are thinking you need more. <laughs> so it becomes like wall to wall. So you actually have to stop yourself then? In a way, yeah. yeah. But then the bad gags fall away. And so you, hopefully you're left with just the good ones. Um, but, you know, I say that. <laughs> All kinds of gags stay in, but... <laughs> You kind of you're not sure about afterwards. <laughs> you know, lots of like really painful puns. And, and How do you manage to make Gromit say so much without saying anything? Mm -hmm. It is amazing to me, especially when you watch it in a cinema on that big screen. How you know what he's thinking, you know what he's saying, yet he never says a word. Yeah, I mean, uh, in a way, Gromit's the the hardest thing. Probably of the whole movie. Uh, has always been the hardest thing and and for other people to pick up on you know we well, as animators you know we 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 have these uh, you know very rigorous like Wallace and Gromit classes that everyone goes through you know spends days trying to capture different expressions and just by moving Gromit's brow uh, and in a way that that for me is the beauty of working with clay because you know Gromit was born out of being clay I, I don't know if he would have happened in quite the same way if he was uh, de you know, designed on a computer 
because um, even going going right back to my days at college when I first designed Gromit, um, he was actually going to have a mouth and he was going to do a lot of barking. I even recorded a voice for Gromit once. Really? Uh, with the guy who did uh, Bill and Ben and Spotty Dog. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, uh, Peter Hawkins. So what made you drop that um, then? Well, it was when I came to do the first shot in a grand day out it was so difficult to get in there with my hands and manipulate his mouth that I just tried, you couldn't see his mouth at the time, but um, it was kind of behind his nose. And I tried moving his eyebrows because it's all I could reach really. And in that moment, in a way, Gromit was born because I, it was pure laziness really, but I found that just by moving his eyebrow up and down, he could speak volumes and, and didn't need a mouth. And he suddenly became also introvert and the intelligent one. And mm. so the whole role reversal suddenly happened in an instant. And, yeah. It's such a clever idea as well, one man and his dog. When did it come to you that there were so many opportunities with just such a simple idea? And let's face it, all the best ideas are simple, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's true. I mean, it was very much out of economy, I, I guess. You know, being a college student and it, and it, it was hard to get any you know as i say it's collaborative filmmaking yeah but as a student it was because animation takes so long it was really hard to get anyone in to light it you know to light do the camera work or produce it i, I ended up having to do a lot of it all the model making and animation myself and so it's pure economy that i made him into a single <laughs> bachelor uh, guy you know he was going to be on his own to start with and he was going to actually have a cat as a companion uh, but I just found a dog easier to make out of plasticine because mm. it was like bigger, rounder shapes and, and, and you could get your fingers round it. And so really, Wallace and Gromit really is just laziness. That's basically... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't, you know, you have a very limited budget and time, you know, so, you, so you, you go for the least number of characters you can cope with, really. I'd love to do a survey and find out what people love more, whether it's Wallace's face or Wallace's voice. Because mm. Peter does such a great job oh, yeah. of, of encapsulating his dippiness, mm. yet his creativeness. I mean, it was so perfect. Did you know mm. from the beginning that Peter Salas was the guy you needed for that role? Yeah, I mean, this was back in 1982 as, as a college student. I, I mean, I knew him from Last of the Summer Wine, and, and from the very beginning he was my first choice. And I, I approached him really as a student, and I think I might have paid him 50 quid or something, but he really did it as a favour, I think, for a poor student. I remember he came in for a morning and, and recorded, and, and I, I just loved the way he said, cheese, you know, and that suddenly, <laughs> <laughs> suddenly Wallace's mouth went extra wide. And, uh, you know, Wallace's character very much came from Peter's voice and the way he said Wensleydale. And, um, so Peter did very much create the character in that sense. Uh, and I, a journalist recently said, Peter Salas's voice is like a pair of warm slippers in an uncertain world. And I, think that, I think that's very much the appeal. Really. That's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. absolutely is. And presumably, Peter has no problem doing this for the rest of his life and career mm. because, I mean, it is just so brilliant for him. We... Uh, you know, me and uh, Steve are quite uh, fussy about the. T you know, we have a very strong idea of what every single kind of line of dialogue should oh, be. You're, you're not like a Royal Shakespeare mm. Company director who's telling him how to say every word. And no, no, we don't want it. You know, like in that. <laughs> are you really like that? I am actually. It's like the animation. You know, you you kind of know how everything should be. But you know, obviously, with a actors like Peter and Ray Fiennes and Helen Carter and all the others, you they give you so much more that you don't expect as well and, and there were certain things um, you know Peter would tell you I'm very fussy about Have you got a favourite line that Peter said for you in obviously this character that, that you wrote that, you, that just sums up the character for you or that you're just so proud of? Is there a single line that you can pick out? Um, gosh that's a difficult one I mean there's the, the, what's really funny is that many of his lines have become kind of catchphrases you know um, cracking toast grommet it was yeah, one of the yeah. first ones <laughs> um, you know and so everything's cracking now you know with when people say cracking you know they think of Wallace and Gromit yep. and a lot of it you know has come from Bob Baker who was a very influential writer on wrong trousers and, and close shave and and a lot of these things, like which was very much a bobism, actually, was no use prevaricating about the bush. And, you know, things like. <laughs> and, I, and I love the way Peter delivers those lines. You know, he's got his his own stamp all the time. 
he has got one of the best voices in show business it's just fantastic and as I say mm. he just makes it so warm mm, and that's yeah. the great thing about it you kind of feel as if yeah. you know him yes you do you do he's, he's, and he's got such a lot of character to it partly it was the the kind of tones in his voice <laughs> you know just those little kind of I've, you find yourself while you're animating, you know, kind of coming out with Wallaceisms all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and all the little. <laughs> There's almost a thought process goes yeah. on in all these, which is usually a very vague, <laughs> blank thought process. But I've, I've always been quite keen to, to kind of, in a way, put my own stamp and style on on things that I do. Um, but you know, without it seeming too kind of forced and. And, you know, from the beginning of Wallace and Gromit, the, you know, the wide mouth and the... And, and also speaking with very fundamental shapes, you know, for the vowels, you know, lots of very obvious shapes for the vowels. It's also a very northern thing, I guess, um, to use the lips a lot, and especially the bottom row of teeth. <laughs> I thank you for doing this, because you're an incredibly private man, it seems to me. You don't mm. do many interviews. Mm. Is it just you want your work to speak for itself, or you don't like talking to journalists? <laughs> no, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I don't mind, you know, I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's hard to always say what you mean, you know, on air, you know, I, I like, I like doing interviews when it's nice and relaxed and, and conversational, like, like anyone, you know, to talk about your work is, you know, it's great to be able to, to talk about it. <laughs> I think I get, especially when it's kind of gets busy, you know, and around publicising mm. the film, it, it gets incredibly tiring. I kind of enjoy making films more than I do talking about them. I suppose, but it, but it's nice to do. Like, like today, it's relaxed and, and not too many interviews. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I'm glad I'm not annoying you. That's the main thing. So let's talk about your upbringing now and your life as a child. And mm. I can only presume that you were scribbling and drawing through your entire childhood to be this talented now. Was mm. it always a passion of yours? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something... I mean, I always loved to draw as a kid and make models. Yeah, and, uh, you know, my family was always very creative and, and uh, always lots going on and... Um, my dad was a photographer and uh, showed me which end of a camera to look down and and my mum's always been into you know making clothes and so there's always offcuts of stuff as well to play around with but I also I also feel very lucky that it's a creative environment but always lots of encouragement to be creative and and if you have a talent to use it and in whatever way it was always the kind of uh, uh, you know atmosphere I, br I was brought up in. And I just love drawing cartoons, you know, I love the Beano, I, you know, I used to, I was an avid reader of the Beano, and uh, I wanted to draw cartoons like that. I, I did my own cartoon strips sometimes, and, and when I was about 13, I discovered that my mum's home movie camera, it's like an 8mm eight, eight Bell and Hell camera, could take single frames, which, I mean, I, no one knew about animation then, so to have an ordinary camera that happened to have an animation button on it, I kind of wonder how that found its way to me. And then I started trying out different, you know, like, cut out animation I started mimicking Terry Gilliam's work for Monty Python and you know I love that kind of surreal wacky humour and, and uh, you know I love the wobbly artwork of Bob Godfrey for Rhubarb and Custard or you know so I tended to go for things which were less sophisticated as the Disney approach and and and, and then you know I saw Morph on the TV and stuff on Vision On you know very creative programme and I started mimicking anything I saw really from the age of 13, 14, 15 and and plasticine was always around, so I, I liked techniques that were kind of very much in front of the camera and very immediate, rather than involving lots of technique and precision and, and know-how. Is being an artist a different talent to being creative with plasticine and making something like Wallace and Gromit, and yet you can't draw anything, or do the two deliberately go together? I, I think they do. I mean, I, I, you know, I started off wanting to be a cartoonist, but and I think being able to draw really does help, actually. Um, I don't think every all the animators are not necessarily, you know, brilliant at drawing, but most have some ability. Graphics and a sense of design and a sense of, you know, composition and, you know, it's, it's all quite important because it's, it's not just cartoon, you know, it's not just comedy, it's about filmmaking and about composing shots and having a kind of overall vision for the movie as well. I mean, what I love about this kind of animation is that it's a, it's a mixture of all the things I've always loved, you know, from all the comedy and slapstick of cartoons and with clay you can be you can be very much like a Warner Brothers cartoon in terms of squash and stretch you know when you bash Wallace's head it can go into his shoulders and pop out again <laughs> at the same time it's very 3D so you know we have 
expert lighting camera people. So you can play around with the camera and you know, it's a kind of a convergence of all these things I've always loved. What's your greatest talent? Is it being an artist and creating these amazing models that you make? Is it observing people? Because that's the thing that you're really brilliant at, is finding a character like Wallace, taking that from real life, we all know someone like Wallace, Mm -hmm. and then putting it into the animation. What is your biggest skill? Oh, my biggest skill? I don't know. I mean, I I like, best of all, coming up with ideas, I, I think. You know, I love working at the storyboard stage and Um, I like kind of taking a situation and trying to draw out as much comedy from that situation as I can and and trying to be a bit a bit different and a bit you know how can I be as soon as you feel an idea is becoming like something else then you how do I change it and find a different slightly different angle and one thing I suppose I've found myself and this I guess this is a tradition in Ardman you know Peter Lord and David Sproxton they were doing it before I got there but you know, on creature comforts, you know, what I love about clay is that you can, even though it's animals in that case, but you can bring out very human observations and traits. I think it's because the, you have this figure sat in front of the camera that's inanimate and it's made of clay. And, you know, you, the film runs at 24 frames per second. So, you know, every, every 24 times you make, you move the figure, you get one second of film in the can. But it means, you, as an animator, you're you're almost like an actor in that you're you're trying to put your emotion into the character, and by tweaking it, you're very hands-on on every single frame of film. So, kind of emotion tends to come through the clay because you're you're able to manipulate it in very small increments, in, and almost with feeling every single frame. So 24 pictures make one second of film. Mm -hmm. So how small are the nuances that you're changing, for example, Gromit's ears in each of these films? Minute, are they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have a Gromit here. (laughs) This is radio. Nothing gets past me. But you've actually brought in the real models with you. And they're they're quite tiny. Yeah. Uh, They're the real size that you actually film with, are they? Yeah, Gromit here is about five inches high, something like that. Wallace is about nine inches high. And, you know, it's made of your ordinary plasticine, you know. And, you know, Gromit's got his, his famous eyebrow there, and he looks rather, uh, I don't know, bewildered or something there. We, we have him in front of the camera like that, and we, the animator, we just tweak his eyebrow slightly like that, you know, take a frame, move it again slightly, take a frame. And it, it varies, you know, through practice, you get to learn how, how far to move things. and. Mm. I'm yeah. used to the bewildered look in my radio studio for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but Gromit, you know, he can change expression dramatically in very small increments. How do you know whether it's going to work? Well, there, I mean, there are ways that we have these days of... You can monitor the movement, you know, on a on a digital frame store as you're going. And, you know, so you can kind of see what you're doing as it's kind of slowly... You know, it's taking frames as you're working and you can see it in playback. I'm I'm a bit old school in that sense, in, in in that people like Steve and myself, and you know we used to do it blind, really, uh, where you couldn't you couldn't see it played back. You had to wait till the film came back from the labs before you saw anything, uh, and so you tended to it was almost you, know, you kind of use the force, you know, <laughs> you know, you put away the technology, and and we sometimes encourage the animators to rely more on their instincts, you know, that come through practice. And that, that, I think, often can get better results because you tend to be a bit more adventurous and less kind of, you know, less kind of relying on the technology. How did you go from being a kid that's playing with plasticine and seems to be quite good to actually turning it into a multi-million pound business? Oh, well, I mean, it was, I suppose it's been a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of support from a lot of people at Ardman. You know, I've been a part of Ardman. You know, ever since I left college. Uh, that was 1985, wasn't it? About 1985, yeah. I, I was halfway through a grand day out at, at the National Film and TV School and I ran out of time and money and, and then Ardman offered to help me finish the film in Bristol. That was just a very small company at the time doing things like Morph for Take Heart. And so because I was... I worked part-time for Ardman for a long time and so the film took another... Well, it's all seven years altogether to finish that. It was very much a single-handed effort. And I think things have slowly grown, you know, as the co- the company slowly expanded. You know, we did the Sledgehammer video for Peter Gabriel and um, many things, many commercials, you know, and so the, the studio has slowly grown. But, you know, I guess Wallace and Gromit has been the kind of signature thing we've become known for over the years. 
I mean, I could never do your job because I have short-term attention span at the best of times. You, you must be the most patient man in the world to be able to spend five years on one project and be as dedicated to it at the beginning as you yeah. are at the end. I mean, it's, a, it's an odd state of mind, isn't it, to be able to yeah. take the time to take 24 pictures to make one yeah. second of film. Yeah, yeah, it is. I think when we did our own projects that we probably did need a lot of patience, really. Uh, the animators... I mean, they're under such pressure to shoot as fast as they can. You know, you can't afford to do more than one take. Sometimes we had to, but... And they've got, you know, like any film, you've got all these production pressures to keep moving. So in, in, a, in a funny way, there isn't time, you know, to need patience because we're, you know, we're shooting on all these sets simultaneously and trying to get film in the can. I mean, it may sound slow, but uh, some, you know, two minutes a week is actually quite fast for animation. Mm. Yeah, you know, we were rocketing through. <laughs> I mean, you're literally working every hour, God sends are you, seven days a week when you're in production. Yeah, I mean, each animator's doing about two or three seconds a day, uh, which amounts to quite a lot of rushes every morning, you know. <laughs> um, and it doesn't sound a lot, but <laughs> I think as well, you know, when you when you really believe in something and, you know, it's a work of art and, and you you don't think about how much it takes you know, a shot may last two or three seconds, but it's one hell of a two or three seconds. Mm. <laughs> it's amazing how much you can fit into to three seconds of film time. Is yeah. there any other way of doing this now or that you would be happy to do? I mean, could you make a Wallace and Gromit film on a computer without having to take all these pictures and do it the old-fashioned way? You know, we're keeping up with digital technology very much. Uh, you know, we're even doing a fully CGI computer-generated film, you know, coming out later this year uh, about rats in the London sewers called Flushed Away. But with Wallace and Gromit, I mean, we've tried, we have put them into, you know, we've done the computer games and, and we've tried putting them into the com in computer on, on film, you know. With Wallace and Gromit, I don't know, it's the clay feel is really important. Mm. It's important, all those small nuances and, and shifts of expression. And, you know, it, I think it does rely on being plasticine myself. The, the, the CG versions we've done tend to look a bit robotic. I wouldn't really like a, to see a film done like that myself. You know, not with Wallace and Gromit anyway. Are um, these like your kids? Uh, yeah, I mean, they are. They are family. They've, I've grown up with them. <laughs> I mean, they, they are the... F you know, I, mean, I did st other stuff at college, but these are the first thing I've done which have actually taken off. So they do... Uh, they are like my kids. I suppose know. the only thing is kids normally cost you money and they make you money, so I suppose they're, they're good kids, aren't they? Yeah, and I've seen them on the covers of magazines and things. I've, I felt quite proud, you know, of my kids doing well out there. Let's get through a few things before you go. Uh, the Fire, that had so many headlines. Is this a PR stunt? The mm. film's released on Monday, the place burns down on Saturday. It was even closer, actually. It was, it, it was actually the morning, the morning I heard that we'd got to the number one in the US box office. Within the same hour, I heard that the whole, you know, the whole warehouse of the whole history of Ardman had burnt down or was burning down <laughs> at the time. How did you feel? Um, well, I mean, something else kind of put it all in perspective, really, is that I'd also spent that morning watching the news about the Pakistan earthquake mm. uh, and, you know, with people, you know, digging their families out of wreckage. And, and uh, so when I actually heard about the fire, I, I mean, obviously, you know, no one had been hurt, so that was that was lucky and, and good news. But it automatically put it in a perspective, so I actually didn't react that badly to it. You know, it, it wasn't much effort to do that. But I suppose there was still stuff that was close to your heart, irreplaceable. There were mm. awards that you'd won back in the beginning. There was nothing mm. to do with the Curse of the Were Rabbit, was it, I, as I understand it? No, that was in a separate exhibition. So it must be kind of hard in a way that you've lost everything before that. Is that right, that there's nothing left of the first stuff you did? Um, well, yeah, at the time, the more I thought about it, uh, the more I heard what had been destroyed. I think we had lost about two and a half million pounds worth of stuff. And it was mainly like sets from Wrong Trousers and all all the earlier Wallace and Gromit films and storyboards, I, yeah, my own personal storyboards I'd done, which were all framed for exhibitions. And, and the stuff did make really lovely exhibitions that people seem to, to like to see, you know, behind the scenes stuff. And so if I think about it too much, you know, it could be quite sad to think about it. I mean, in a way, I felt sorry for the people who kept the exhibition looking really good, you know, over the years. And, and it was a lot of work went into it. But as far as I'm concerned, it was made for the films and it had its use. And, mm. and in a way, I was, 
I was touched by how how it was so much. We got such a, a lovely reaction from people that I didn't realise it meant so much. You know? Well, I think people believe that Wallace yeah. and Gromit are real. Yeah, it's a bit yeah. like Coronation Street. Yeah. We believe that those characters really yeah. do exist. And when we heard that their home had burnt down yeah. and they'd gone with it, it just had the most peculiar reaction across the country. People were genuinely upset for you. I, I know. I I was I was really amazed because I was getting letters from. I mean, uh, you know, from people in uh, in Los Angeles as much as from Britain, you know. I got a letter from Prince Charles. Did you, know, you really? Yeah, a very, very kind of heartfelt letter, actually, of saying how sad he was to hear about it and wish, wishing us all the best. The final question I want to ask you about this, do we know why it happened or how it happened? Uh, they believe it was um, an electrical fault. So it wasn't malicious, at least. No, no, it was suspected it was something because there'd been a few fires started around that area. But, but yeah, they've no evidence of arson, I don't think. OK, so. let's move on to matters more pleasant. Your international success, the fact that, as you say, in America you've hit number one. Uh, you're winning awards left, right and centre. Oscars, BAFTAs, Annies, I believe you keep winning. How do you feel? Does it bother you? Does it matter? Does it give you any better feeling than seeing a 90-minute film that you've made over five years anyway? <laughs> I like winning awards. <laughs> no, no. It's, I think because they take so long to make, you know, the long-haul nature of animation is... You have to really do it for the love of it. And I think that's what motivates us all at Ardman, really. But it's nice having done all that work to get recognition. And, um, you know, for, you know, I was relieved just that the film was working for some people, you know, you know that we'd done something right, you know, to start with. So now to go on to get awards is, is nice, you know. I don't, I don't mind, you know. If- <laughs> I've only known you for about an hour or so, but I can't imagine you're the kind of guy that would mm. want to go to the Oscars. I mean, I wouldn't associate myself with the Oscars. When I first went there, you know, you think, I guess I made this plasticine animated <laughs> film. And I'm here with these, like, wall-to-wall celebs, you know, <laughs> Dustin Hoffman. And, you know, everywhere you look, you know, you, you, it's like in a, some kind of strange dream, you know, where all these, everyone you've ever heard of is in one room. What about that feeling that they know who you are? Because that's yeah. odd, isn't it? The fact that yeah. you know who they are because they're big stars, but you don't think you are, yet they know who you are and they want to talk to you. How yeah. do you deal with that? I'm not, I, I never know if they do, actually. I, I never assume anyone knows who I am. So, you know, because you get invited to these you know, parties and Elton John's party and stuff. I remember if you, if you stood there with an Oscar, people just come up to you and shake your hand. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I remember Tom Hanks coming up to me. He had no idea who I was. This was with wrong trousers, I think. And, <laughs> and he just a great speech. And, I, you know, and, and, uh, and I had, there was someone there telling me who I'd met after I'd met them because I, I didn't recognise anyone. Or, you know, that was Claudia Schiffer. You know, that was Prince, you know. That's amazing. And, and, <laughs> Yes, it is, it is weird, actually. Who have you been most overwhelmed by when they've watched one of your films and they've come back to you and said, this is the best thing I've ever seen? It's made me laugh, it's made me cry. Is there any single person who you didn't imagine? I suppose having a letter from Prince Charles is a, mm. a pretty nice accolade, isn't it? But who yeah. else has impressed you with their interest in Wallace and Gromit? Um, oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, I can't think of really. Gosh, off the top of my head. You know, I mean, when Prince Charles first... Uh, when I heard that he'd seen Wallace and Gromit and uh, things you never imagine who's watching, you know, uh, you know, because it's been on TV at Christmas and holiday times. You can't ever imagine who's watching. And so, uh, you know, I'm an ambassador for the Prince's Trust and I was just stood there, you know, with a glass of champagne in my hand and Elton John came up to me and introduced himself. And, you know, I, I wouldn't have imagined he knew who I was. Uh, uh, just people isn't it you know so it's I think you've got a fantastic life because you're a huge whopping great big star that has got such great things around you you've Mm -hmm. won so many awards so many people respect Mm -hmm. you so many people love you and moreover the public just love what you do Yet you can go in Sainsbury's and nobody will bother you. I can't think of a better way to live your life. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's perfect, really. It is, it is the best balance, really. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I've got it best, on, best of both worlds, really. 